Hi everyone. Thank you once again for taking the time to watch. It's Tuesday and it's time for a spiritual pick-me-up. We've been studying through Psalm 23 and today it's time for us to ask the question, what is that valley of the shadow of death that we walk through? But before we begin that, I'd like to ask something of you. I'd like you to just stop for a moment and say a prayer for Chris and Amber and John Luke Pickock. Most of you have a good idea of what's going on in their life, but if you don't, John Luke is their very young son and he's going through an awful lot right now. He has a very rare disease that is affecting his motor skills and a lot of other things. In fact, it's so rare there's only one clinic and research facility in America that's working on it. Chris and Amber had to take John Luke to the hospital just yesterday to hopefully find some relief. And as of the last report, it wasn't going very well. John Luke has been battling this for a while. Chris and Amber have remained faithful and steadfast. And when most of us would have given up and broken down, have not. And so if you're watching this and you don't know them, would you pray for them? So many people here at our congregation and our community and the people who love the Pickhawks have been praying for years for just any kind of relief. Some days John Luke finds it and some days he doesn't. And so I just ask that if you'll stop and you'll pray for them, I know it can do good. I know that the fervent prayer of righteous men accomplishes much. I don't know when and how and why that'll be accomplished for John Luke, but I pray it'll be soon. And so today, as we think about Psalm 23 and the comfort that comes from our shepherd, if you'll just pray for them, I would greatly appreciate it. I know they know people care and that we want to do more and help. And it's so hard to feel helpless. But I know that God is not and that he can do great things. So I pray that this will in some way, shape, or form, help them, and that you can be a part of the people who pray for them. Last week, we talked about the first two verses of Psalm 23. It perhaps is the most well-known passage in all of Scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those words have come off of the lips of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in this world in maybe even the last few months. We know deep down that the Lord is a provider, that he cares for us, and that he, he guides us. And I, I think that we understand that. But let's be brutally honest. In moments of spiraling uncertainty, we ask the question exactly, where is our shepherd? I don't want you to think that God is twiddling his thumbs, has overlooked us, I want you to realize that this is just a season of life. Ecclesiastes 3 says there are all kinds of seasons. And so for us to endure this is possible. And I believe it's because of our shepherd. In Psalm 23 today, it's time for us to think about verses 3 and 4. There are only six verses there. So for us to see each week a couple of thoughts, we think about now the middle section. Verse 3 says that he, the Lord, Restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Last week, as we spoke about God being a provider, we moved this week to God being our protector. And I love the idea that restoration is a part of protection. I love watching car shows on TV where old scrap cars, just something that looks so junky and, and worn out that we should just get rid of, is brought back to its glory. It's restored and made, made beautiful again. Scripture's full of restoration stories. Think about Noah. Think about the world that was restored in God's image. Think about Ezra and Nehemiah, perhaps my favorite restoration story in all of Scripture, Nehemiah, standing before King Ahasuerus, sad, says, why should I be happy when the, the home of my fathers, my home, its walls are torn down and its inhabitants are exposed, are in danger and peril. 
restoration is a key to a relationship with Jesus Christ, to a appreciation of God the Father and Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit. And it's our understanding of what it is he does for me and how he does it. When it says he restores my soul, I can't help but think of David when he was talking to Solomon in 1 Samuel 17. It says, I went and I grabbed the sheep from the mouth of the lion or the bear took it from him. And I, I put him back where he belonged. That's restoration. It shouldn't be lost on us that elsewhere in Scripture, the devil is described as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But our shepherd is there to restore us, especially my soul, my being, who I am to restore me into his fold, into his protection. It says, though, that he also leads me. Where? Not, not into crooked, lost places, but down paths of righteousness. I can't help but think of the quote when it says, do not take the path that most have gone. Instead, blaze your own path. Well, well I appreciate that. My friends, we find no comfort down the path no one has gone before. We're uncertain, uneasy, because the steps we don't know where the next one leads. And there's this image in Scripture that Jesus has walked our path. Now we simply follow him. Now maybe the path that most people follow isn't his path. I'll admit to that. And so a Christian inherently seems to go down a path that very few people trail. But it's not the path that we lead. It's the path he leads. For he leads me down paths of righteousness. For whose sake? For his sake, for his name's sake, that glory be brought to him. You know, a, a shepherd would be rewarded. I think not just with some kind of monetary value, but with respect and appreciation. If he took a hundred sheep out and brought a hundred sheep back. The parable when Jesus talked about the lost sheep, it says, what shepherd who has 99 sheep safe would not leave the 99 who are safe to go find the one that was lost? reminds me here of this passage that he's our protector that when we need it he's there to restore us and to lead us and to guide us and to get us where we are supposed to be verse 4 might be the most impactful verse in the entire psalm and I think it's easily the one that we misunderstand the most for this is the verse we think about when we're at a funeral. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And we may think of the people who are fearing no evil now who are gone, but really this is us. And I believe that David was thinking about, yeah, David and Goliath. And as he walked into the valley of Elah, into the shadow of death, that giant standing in front of him, I will fear no evil, for who is with me? You remember that Goliath basically said, why are you insulting me? But today I will kill you, boy. And what did David say? Today the Lord will deliver me into your hand. I will fear no evil, for you are with me, should be the rallying cry of all Christians. It doesn't mean that evil doesn't, let's be honest, scare us. Give us a bit of a fright when it catches us off guard. But my fear, my fear of it quickly dissipates when I realize how much stronger God is than that evil. The phrase, you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Give us a description that God is not just there, but is actively involved in our life. The rod and the staff were tools of the shepherd to keep them not just where they were supposed to be, but protect them from those things that were not to be around them. Think of it as an instrument, uh, not of war, of protection. God's word is an instrument of protection. It gives us guidance about where to go, encouragement about what to say and do. And it reminds us that God is a part of our life. Where can I go from his presence? And if God is for us, who is against us? My friends, life is not always full of moments we praise and bless. But life is always full of God who we can praise and bless through every moment. 
We stick on David a lot because this is one of his psalms. But when I read that passage, you know, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. I don't think of just David and Goliath. I also think about that moment after his son has died, the child that was, well, born out of wedlock when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Do you remember how he threw himself at God's mercy, trying to, to, to bring anything into that boy's life that could save him? He wept, he, he, he mourned, he, 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 he was overcome. You remember the scene. When he found out the boy had died, remember what he did? It, it's almost as shocking. He got up and cleaned himself. And he went and worshipped. David, even in his lowest point, seems to realize that God is with him. May we be able to do that as well. Many of us are traveling through a valley right now, and we're not exactly sure when we'll rise out of it. But I can assure you of this. God's with you, even in the lowest point. I'd love for us to not ever be afraid. That's just impractical. But I'd love today something that we can do to happen. To remember that the fear you possess is not stronger than the God you serve. And the thing that stands in your way cannot defeat him. My friends, God is with us. If we remember one thing today, may we remember that. And whatever it is we're facing, doesn't stand a chance. Thank you so very much for watching, always being a part of the time we spent here online. I pray you have a wonderful, blessed day, and that you remember God is always with